Thanks for joining me for another class, Fortifying Your Faith in a Time of Deconstruction. Originally, I had planned to teach this class this summer at the Oregon City Church uh, for our All Summer Bible Adventure on Wednesday nights. I had intended for it to be a discussion class where we could have back and forth comments about this important topic. Uh, because there are right now some ideas that have been floating around that have become very popular. And uh, they are causing a lot of problems. And part of the problem is, is not just the negative aspect of what they're teaching, but we often don't understand the positive side of things. And so I wanted this to be a positive class, fortifying our faith, looking at these doctrinal things, these biblical things, and strengthening ourselves with them. And at the same time, looking at the time of deconstruction, look at some of the things that, that they were teaching that I think are dangerous. They're dangerous because they have led a lot of people away from Christianity. I have been using this little book by Michael Kruger, uh, entitled uh, The Ten Commandments of Progressive Christianity. I've been using it more or less just as an outline, as a guide to stay focused. Uh, he calls it the Ten Commandments of Progressive Christianity. I'm not sure if I like the term progressive, but that's what they call themselves, as progressive Christians, and that's how they're referred to oftentimes as progressive Christianity. Uh, the problem is, that for me, is the idea of progressive means they're moving forward, that they that they're going moving beyond what we already know to something more positive, something better. And in reality, it's just a new form of liberalism that we've had around a long time. They are just repackaging it in a way that looks better. Uh, they're giving you a Christianity that is more politically correct, that's less harsh, that is, is more open to, to everyone, that, that anybody can accept, and it's very dangerous at the same time. Uh, and so I want to look at what they believe, but I also want to look at, at how we should focus on these things. Now, so far we've looked at three of these, uh, of the Ten Commandments, three of their beliefs. Let me repeat them. The first thing they believe is that Jesus is a model for living more than an object for worship. And that's just not true. Jesus is God. He is worthy of worship. Secondly, affirming people's potential is more important than reminding them of their brokenness. There's not a big belief in sin. And third, the work of reconciliation should be valued over making judgments. And last week we looked at the, the dangers of judging people and what the Bible says about judging people. And now the fourth thing, what we'll look at today is this gracious behavior is more important than right belief. That's their statement. That gracious behavior is more important than right belief. How you behave is more important than what you believe, more important than theology, more important than doctrine. And uh, behavior. The problem for many Christians is that they want to turn Christianity into a works-oriented religion. And I think it's just our default to go back to the idea of works. And so uh, we often fall into this and we ask ourselves, well, I wonder if I've done enough. I wonder if I've studied enough. I wonder if I've prayed enough. I wonder if I have given enough. I, I wonder if I've been good enough. Enough, enough, enough. And, and we, we begin to question our salvation because we don't know if we've done quite enough. Uh, we'll listen to somebody and they'll say, well, I read my Bible every day and I read it twice on Sunday. And we begin to think, well, maybe I don't read my Bible enough to, to go to heaven. Now, any version, any version of Christianity that focuses more on what man has done than what God has done is an error. Any Christianity that focuses more on man than on God is just wrong. Christianity begins and ends with our focus on God. Salvation and the Christian life is what God has done for us and what God is doing for us more than anything else. It is about 
how God has so loved us that he sent his son for us. It is about his mercy and his grace. Now, if you've heard me preach, I've given the definition for mercy and grace quite often. And let me just do it one more time. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Uh, this is the mercy of God. We deserve, because we are sinners, we deserve to be lost. We deserve to be separated from God. We deserve to spend eternity in hell. But God has shown us mercy. We didn't get what we deserve. And the other part is grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. I don't deserve this relationship with God. I don't deserve the part of his family, the church. I don't deserve all these things and these blessings that God has given to me. And so we have mercy and grace as the bedrock of salvation and the Christian life. It's not based on my perfection. It's not based on my behavior. It's based on what God has done for me. I'm not, I'm not saved because I'm so good. You know, I don't want to do all these wonderful things so I can be saved. Instead, what we read in Scripture is, I'm saved... Now I want to be good. Uh, I am saved by the blood of Jesus. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Everything that we do is based upon Jesus. And grace brings us into relationship with God. It's based on the death, burial, and resurrection. It's based upon what Jesus on the cross has done for us. Uh, now, what I believe is essential. Uh, what I believe is essential. Because emphasizing behavior over grace, so what I believe about grace is essential. Because if I start focusing on behavior rather than on grace, I'm going to live in constant fear. And I know some Christians that are living in constant fear. Uh, maybe I'm not trying hard enough. Maybe I'm not being good enough. Maybe I haven't done it enough to be saved. Uh, but I am saved. And now I can strive and focus on imitating Christ. I'm not trying to be kind and gentle and forgiving uh, because that's a nice thing to do or because that's politically correct or because I want to go to heaven. I want to do those things because that's what it means to imitate Jesus. Jesus was those things. And so I've got to allow God to transform my life to allow me to become more like Jesus by the renewing of my mind. As I read scripture, as I pray to God, there is this constant transformation going on in my life. As I meet with other Christians, I'm encouraged to continue on this path of renewal. I often say, I'm not what I want to be. But thank God I'm not what I used to be. And praise God I'm not what I'm going to be. I'm not what I want to be. Uh, Paul said, I am the foremost of sinners. I'm the chief of sinners, he said. He didn't say, I used to be the foremost of sinners, or I was the foremost. I am there was a realization that he was not what he wanted to be, but thank God he wasn't what he used to be, a persecutor of the church. And praise God, he's not what he's going to be. He's going to be with God for eternity because of this relationship. Now, see, doctrine, theology, your belief, explains life and salvation. It keeps everything in balance. Doctrine explains the fall of man. It explains to us what happened there in the garden. It explains to us the call of Abraham. It explains the life of Jesus, his death, burial, his resurrection, his ascension. It explains to us the establishment of the church. It explains God. Doctrine is not intended to give us just more information it's intended to produce a radical transformation in our lives. To allow us to become more like Jesus in thought, word, and deed. God uses doctrine. 
God uses theology. God uses our belief in Scripture to turn us around, to turn us from angry people into peacemakers, to turn us from greedy into givers, to take us from being proud to being humble, to take us from being demanding to being servants. He changes us from being rebels to obedient servants of His. The focus of all theology when you boil it down, and this is what Jesus was asked to do in Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Just boil it all down for us. What's the most important aspect of this? It, it says here in, in chapter 22 of Matthew that one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. It's having this relationship with God. Uh, it's having this healthy relationship with others. It is so sad to see Christians having unhealthy relationships having them continue to struggle with broken lives. Uh, I've seen Christian homes that have been shattered by divorce. Some Christians stay married, but they're just unhappy. Uh, their homes are, are full of tension. Uh, I've seen some bounce from church to church, leaving a trail of, of broken relationships. But God wants us to have a good relationship with Him and a good relationship with others. And... He's helped us by giving us his word to explain how to do that. You see, doctrine, theology, tells us what is right and what is wrong. Any a declaration of what is right or wrong is a doctrinal statement. It's a statement of belief. It's a statement of theology, and it's so important. And here's where the rub is, because progressive Christians, they want to be the ones who dictate what is right or wrong. Whatever is right is what they think is right. Whatever is wrong is what they think is wrong. You know, what is right to you is right for you. And what's wrong for you is wrong from, for you. But what's right for me is right for me. What's wrong? For, you know, the old uh, movement that we had for a while, people had the bracelets, you know, what would Jesus do? And the weakness of that is that eventually Jesus would do whatever you were going to do. And so <laughs> Jesus was just going to mimic what I'm going to do. Instead of Jesus... Instead of doing what Jesus would do, we started saying what Jesus would do, what I would do. And that's what the progressive Christians have done. They're just saying, well, Jesus would do whatever I'm doing. And instead, what we have to do is look at the life of Jesus and strive to imitate him. Now, uh, one of the accusations that come from progressive Christians when we get to this point, they say, well, now, you know, you're just being like the Pharisees. You're being pharisaical about all this stuff. Uh, the Pharisees, uh, they had this overemphasis on doctrine and theology. But did they really? That's not what Jesus said. In Matthew, the 23rd chapter, Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples. And he said, the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you do and observe but do not do according to their deeds for they say things and do not do them well they had the right ideas they had the teachings of moses whatever they teach you from the law do those things but their problem was not doctrine their problem was hypocrisy hypocrisy is pretending to be something you don't intend to be they pretended to be righteous. They pretended to be right all the time, and they just weren't. And, and in fact, what we read here is that it wasn't bad theology at all, but it was the legalism. Now, legalism is demanding more for salvation than God does. It's demanding more of somebody else than God demands of them. And that's what they were doing. And he says in verse 4, they tie up heavy burdens and lay on, the, on them 
lay them on men's shoulders that they themselves are unwilling to move them and with so much as a finger. That they put this heavy burden on people that God never intended, that God did not want. That's what legalism is, is uh, demanding more than God does. In fact, they were putting man-made laws ahead of God's laws. That was the problem. We think that they were too focused on doctrine sometimes when and uh, when just the opposite is the truth. They weren't focused enough on doctrine. We think that doctrine is going to make us dogmatic and narrow-minded and unloving and even mean. But it was not too much emphasis. It was just not enough. In fact, as you go down in Matthew 23 and there's a scathing uh, rebuke by Jesus of the Pharisees and the scribes, you come down to verse 23, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and deal and come and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. <laughs> they were putting the emphasis on, on the wrong things. And I think so often we put the wrong emphasis on behavior. We notice it and we should focus on behavior as my behavior like Jesus. But we look at it as a means to salvation rather than the result of salvation. And now behavior is part of my imitating Jesus, being transformed into the likeness of Christ. The Pharisees, as you look at them, their theology glorified man rather than glorifying God. Remember what I said at the beginning, any religion that glorifies man, that puts more focus on man than on God, is just wrong. Uh, when we think about how great we are rather than how great God is, we're wrong. If you think you're good enough to go to heaven, there's something wrong with you. If you can read through scripture and come out feeling self-righteous, you've misread something. I'm thankful every day for God's mercy that I'm not getting what I deserve, for His grace that I've gotten what I don't deserve. I get a relationship with God. I can speak to Him freely every day. I can put my cares and, and my uh, hopes and trust in Him. Everything it can be in Him. You, you see, behavior is not more important than belief. Because belief determines your behavior. Did you get that emphasis? It's exactly the opposite of what progressive Christians are telling us. They're, they're saying, well, you know, belief is not important. It's really gracious behavior that's more important than anything else. No, that's not true. Belief was going to determine whether you're going to have gracious behavior. Your belief is going to determine whether or not you're striving to imitate Jesus. If people want to be more gracious, the answer is not try harder. It's not focus on your behavior. The answer is then focus on Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Focus on what He has done. He has died for us. And now we have a new life, a new life with the Spirit of God living within us, a new life in Jesus. Uh, I have that Blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I mean, we have this. Christianity is now transforming us. And the wonderful thing about Christianity is that it transformed us with a story. It told us the story of Jesus, of how he lived his life and how he died for us, how he lived to the, to the glory of God and, and how he was raised up for the glory of God and how he was ascended and how he now lives within us. It, this is news. It's a story. It's news. It's the good news of Jesus. I'm not perfect, but I love Jesus Christ. I can rest on his promises. I can go forth in peace. I can praise God because... Not because I'm thinking, well, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Look what I've done. Look what I'm doing today. No, because of what God has done for
for me. And, and so as we look at some of these ideas that are creeping into Christianity, some of them, they, they seem to be true and they seem to be politically correct and, and they might even be true to the way we are thinking, but we measure them against God's word. We find out that they, that they lack some things and they misdirect us. And instead of leading us closer to God and in a stronger relationship with him, I'm af afraid that they're going to leave us away, lead us away from God. Well, I'm trying to fortify your faith in a time of deconstruction. I'm trying to stay positive in this. Not just to look at, at what they're saying, but to look at what the scriptures say so that our faith can be stronger, that our faith in God can be stronger, and that our behavior is going to be one that reflects Jesus. Not because I'm going to go to heaven, which I do want to go to heaven, but because I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like him who loved me and gave himself up for me. Thanks for spending this time with me. I really enjoyed looking at these ideas with you. I'll talk to you again next week. You have a wonderful week.